Hey everybody, this is Dr. Daniel Choi here at North Texas Dental Surgery. Uh, here this morning, we have several of the doctors here to answer some of the most common questions that patients may have if they're interested in the all on four dental implant process. Um, so we're gonna hear, be here and answer some of these questions. And at the end, we'll even in, um, talk about a controversial topic even amongst dentists of who even should be a candidate for all on four. So let's get into this. Um, could you introduce you guys? Uh, Dr. Manbu Nguyen. I'm Dr. Daniel Choi. I'm Dr. Ioana Kukusaki. I'm Dr. Tyson Koo. All right, awesome. So let's go into the first common question we see during an all on four consultation. Patient may be interested in going through the process. They love what the results may be like. Um, but the first question they may ask, because obviously work, what is their recovery going to look like? So what are your thoughts, Dr. Wynn? Yeah, the first thing I tell them is uh, how it's all about individual, right? How easily do you bruise? If you bruise easily, uh, the swelling and pain may become a little bit longer than most people. But I always say three to five days is where it's the most intense. After that, it, it's just start to subside. Okay. okay, that's great. I think you bring up an interesting point. Um, my most common, like the way I like to answer this question is, I like to tell people that, you know, back in school we have that, you know, we learn about the bell-shaped distribution curve, right? Um, I think that you have outliers. I had a patient that we did her upper all on four back on Wednesday a few days ago, and um, we did her upper, but six months ago, she, we did her lower. We did her lower, that's what she wanted to focus on, and she loved the results, and so she wanted to do her upper. And um, we were just briefly talking about after the surgery, I was telling her what antibiotics she needed to take and also, you know, what the pain meds and the schedule and, you know, hey, contact me if you have any questions. But um, it was interesting because she said that, you know, I only took like one ibuprofen when I did the lower all on four. And, you know, we can't run with that and say, hey, yeah, you should only be taking like a few ibuprofen and maybe a few hydrocodone and you'll be fine. Obviously, on the other end of the spectrum, we have patients that tell me that they were in pain for three or four weeks, right? Now, obviously, that patient is an outlier also. Like, most patients do not say anything nearly remotely like that. But, you know, again, those are the outliers in your bell distribution curve. And I would say most people are going to be under that curve, right? So 80% is going to be underneath that curve. And what is their response going to be like? So um, I tell people, on average, I would say that maybe you're going to be on ibuprofen for like a week just to be safe. And then also, if that's not doing enough for the pain, then I would also couple that with the hydrocodone, which is what we always also give them. So, um, and in regards to like, yeah, like will you be like achy a little bit? Yeah, absolutely, And which is why you're gonna be taking some of the medication. But um, in regards to what are we exactly talking about also? Are we talking about um, how much time you're gonna have to take off work, right? I think there's going to be a certain expectation that you're going to be going back to work and you still may need some ibuprofen and, you know, every six hours. But, you know, I think that's to be expected. And it also depends on how fast you want to get back to work. But and then if a person's asking me how long do they want to take off work, then I'll tell them, hey, you know, it's probably going to be safest to say like a week, like maybe five business days. I think that would be a safe guesstimate. I do like I'm always about trying to set expectations, you know, under promising over delivering. I think it would be um, irresponsible of us to say, hey, you're going to be fine. Uh, just take a day or two off of work. You know, while that may be the case, um, I think it would be a safer estimate just for your work expectations to say maybe you might need, it, need like five business days off. Um, and then I wanted to reemphasize what you said earlier. Um, your, how easily do you bruise? What is your pain response? And like, you know, most people like, well, they'll say like, hey, I, I have a, nor I have a, I'd say I have a low pain tolerance or I have a high pain tolerance, then let's go with that, right? And if you, you know, you, you, you bump into a corner of the wall and you bruise, that's not a good sign, right? So, you know, I would say like elderly and white females that you tend to see more bruising on, then I think that you're going to see more swelling and bruising. Now, I'm sorry, this is a very long-winded answer, but the other thing I would say too is swelling doesn't necessarily mean pain either, right? So it, it can look worse than it actually is. But the reality is, though, that swelling can also cause discomfort. Like if it gets into your jaw joints, trying to open and close, you can have a little tightness back there, too. So, um, yeah, it's I really think it also does come out to like we can try to give you a ballpark estimate. But also, if you know yourself and know how you typically go through any past surgeries or um, any pain that you've experienced and um, also like how easily you bruise. What are your thoughts? Yeah, um, just like uh, what you said, I like to uh, under promise and over deliver. Mm -hmm. So uh, whenever a patient asks me, oh, how long am I going to be in pain? I usually tell them about a week or two, you're going to be in pain. And then sometimes some of the patients tell me, oh, 
you know, it wasn't actually as bad as I thought it was going to be. Right. Yeah. That's, that's a great point. We, we don't want to like scare anybody off from doing the procedure because it is life changing. Um, at the same time, we don't want to be irresponsible and almost seem like we're lying. Yeah, and it's the same thing. When we do our consults, what are we looking for to see if it, what are the chances of them swelling, bruising, and pain? Like we look for big infections that's going to take longer for it to heal, anything with involvement to sinuses or nerves, which kind of gives us a better estimate of like, is this time, three, five day or one week average is going to be longer because these lingering infections they've had for months or even years are going to take a, take a little bit longer to subside. Right, right. And that's, that's a very interesting point. Um, a big part of your recovery too is what is the status of your bone at that time, right? How much um, infection do you have? Um, how difficult would it be to take out your teeth? If your teeth are extremely broken down and therefore during the extraction process requires more bone removal or whatever, and then becomes, that becomes more invasive surgery. And then the other thing I wanted to talk about is also how much bone loss do you have? Do you need zygomatic implants? Do you need pterygoid implants? Do you need more dental implants? Um, how many teeth are we taking out? So I think if your, your surgeon's well experienced, then they'll be able to give you like a, a pretty decent ballpark of what, like what you should expect. So um, any other things that you wanted to add, Dr. Kukisaki? Yeah, uh, like on the teeth portion, um, teeth part of the, of the whole surgery, I think as you mentioned, the tightness of the jaw will give a very um, limited mouth opening at some point. That's gonna be either the day after, like two days after. So that's why it's very, very important to give the teeth the same day or even like the day after uh, maximum and then just adjust as much as possible. And then we can just let the patient be with these for like a, a week or two. And at that point we can do, if, if there is any sharp edge, so we can polish that off or also just make, make sure that the bite is, you know, uh, ideal at that point. So, you know, um, as you said, it's normal to get bruised and just have that tightness and uh, limited uh, space uh, while opening the mouth. Uh, but we just want to make sure that you have um, a good bite, chewing, and whenever you're going to speak, it's going to be more normal. Right. So you bring a very interesting point. Um, I was talking to a patient that we'd seen, um, she came in for a reconsult yesterday, and we had seen her this past summer, so about six months ago. And, um, you know, with the digital process of all on four being so revolutionary, um, there's, there's pros and cons to the whole process, right? And so how does that, you know, with you, Dr. Kukusaki being a prosthodontist, how does our responsibility, if I'm just doing the surgery and actually placing the implants, and then once I hand it off to you, if I don't take the amount of swelling or how the recovery process is going to be for that patient into account, and I just blindly throw you the procedure and be like, hey, you know, we're just gonna restore or like insert the prosthesis tomorrow. Um, that patient, if they go through a more brutal procedure or if they have a lot more swelling because they have a tendency to have more swelling, and then you try to deliver dual arches the next day when they have very limited jaw opening because of all the swelling, and again, this is not everybody, but uh, assuming worst case scenario that you do have a 70-year-old white female that comes in and has this situation, then you're going to be compromised trying to even screw in the prosthesis the next day. The right. from the she patient. doesn't want that in her mouth at exactly. that time. She's in discomfort the next day. Soft tissue has kind of like shaved from the day before, so we can't really push it that much unless we give her a lot of like um, local anesthesia, which is going to be painful again. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's going to be trickier from, for the dentist since the mouth will not open that much. Uh, and also will be trickier to do all the occlusal adjustments or like the bite adjustments. Right, right. right. So it's like a lot of people may, might get the confusion that when we just, you know, 3D print or mill your teeth, your temporaries, and we're inserting them that day, the next day, that there's no adjustment of your bite that's necessary. That's not true. The patient, like the day of the surgery is very numb. It's like, um, it's very drowsy. They, they have, they're under pain at some point, so they can't really uh, move their jaw at the correct bite. So we need to make the adjustments. It might be a tiny bit. It might be a lot more. Depends on the case. Uh, however, we have to make sure everything is ideal before they go into that recovery process of four months, four or five months. Right, right, right. So you're, because again, like a lot of patients, they don't know what they don't know. But so like the bottom line of what your result, I mean, what you're saying is if we could do same day delivery, that would help you out a lot, right? So with the advent of the whole digital process and our ability to basically deliver teeth the next day, um, 
it is kind of convenient. Like for example, like I mean, both are kind of convenient. Um, you know, the process and the way that all for always was was that we would do your surgery, take your teeth out, place the implants, and then do your chair side conversion, where we would take a denture, grind it down, and then retrofit it into your mouth. Right now, most providers probably don't do that anymore. I mean, actually, they a lot of providers still do, but. Now with the, the advent of the, the digital process and now how that's increasing in popularity, um, what I'm seeing is that there's a lot of providers that are either, either delivering the, the 3D printed teeth that day um, or they're delivering next day. Um, so, you know, people will try to tell you, hey, you know, like you're gonna just be here for like two, three hour surgery. You get to go home, be in the comfort of your own bed. And that's a great point versus them staying, you know, like, all day because the teeth are being digitally designed after the surgery and or 3D printed and or milled. But you know we have a 3D printer and a milling machine and we'll tell you that when we mill the teeth, it, it takes more time, right? To mill it, you know, it's, it's just gonna require more time. So typically, if whoever you're going to then tells you that you're gonna get your converted teeth the next day, your temporary teeth the next day, you may have the challenge of not being able to open very much, right? So. That's the whole bottom line of this. That's where the prosthetic component, when Dr. Fukusaki being the prosthodontist, putting the teeth in your mouth, um, she's basically potentially gonna be compromised. We do lots of all on four here. We do see patients sometimes where they can't open, like when we delivered mill teeth or, or they, they try to come in the next day and try to open, they, they couldn't open, you know? So that is a possibility and that's a, a disclosure that patients need to know about. It's the same thing when you do dentures, right? When you take out teeth, if, it's, if you can't get that denture in, I, I follow up in a week or two because they're not going to want me back in their mouth because mm -hmm. you're just too sore. Right. And to even articulate wearing something in your mouth to bite down, it, that in itself is a challenge. And also, if we decide to do the next day delivery, sometimes we have to numb the patient the following day to even insert the prosthesis, and patients don't like to go through that. Absolutely. Major, major important point. All right, so let's talk about post-surgery. Um, you're now home, you got your teeth in your mouth, you love them, but now you're wondering what to do with them. Um, so let's talk about aftercare, essentially. Um, let's talk about diet, let's talk about exercise, what you can and you can't do. Um, Dr. Kukasaki will go into some of her prosthetic, um, her thoughts in regards to that aspect of it. So what are your thoughts, of, what do you tell your patients about diet? Diet, I tell them, um, if they've ever been through like an implant thing before, they know that we are placing the implant and they're literally not, not eating on that one solo implant. But the great beauty with all in four is we can, if all the forces are good, that we're loading the implant because of stability. Across our stabilization, I tell them it's like a leg on a chair. Imagine having one have one leg, it's supposed to happen four, it's pretty stable with four. But at the same time, you really want to be cautious with the, those teeth because you're still waiting for them to stabilize which takes, you know, for us eight to 12 weeks for those implants to really take. Right, um, very key, important point. And uh, I want to, I think it's so important, I want to expand on that. Um, the aspect of why, you know, not to bash on three on six or individual implant bridges, but when you have everything in one prosthesis, it's, it's all one set of teeth. What that does on your dental implants is that solidifies it and it basically reduces the stress on each implant. The more stress you have on that implant, the more likelihood you have of that implant failing, right? And so the whole concept of all on four being a crazy concept where you take your teeth out, place the implants and put the teeth on one day, patients need to understand that that is um, like, you know, again, when this was first introduced, 20 some years ago, this was a crazy concept. Like literally people thought that Dr. Palomala was cons like basically committing um, like uh, malpractice, right? It was just such a crazy concept. Like this guy was a lunatic, right? But I mean, turns out that he was a genius and he was applying like laws of physics. Now, just as you said, when you're doing a single implant, you, like if I'm doing a single molar, then I'm like, you know, patients say like, oh, we can put a tooth on there and just bring down the bite a little bit. Like, I, I'm not doing that. Like, I like predictability, right? So what I like would do in my mouth, I want predictability. There's no way I would do that. Now we know for a front tooth, you can, you know, you can get better aesthetics sometimes. You can mold the tissues if you place the implant and put on a, a temporary tooth that same day versus them having to wear a flipper. Patients love that idea. Of course, 
when we see that, we say, we can do this for you, but you better be super, super careful. Because if you're not and this goes bad, then we have a catastrophe on our hands, right? But we're more inclined to do it. Like we, we, we don't mind doing it because we can get, you know, molding of the gingival architecture and get better papilla. And I know this gets really deep in the woods, but long story short, this is what would give you a very ideal outcome. Now, when you're doing all on four dental implants or you're doing multiple implants and trying to put all your set of teeth on them, that is, again, taking out your teeth. We used to take out your teeth and bone graft. And if we were cowboys and we were very you know, risky, we would actually place the implants the same day, what we call immediate implants. That's where we stopped. That's how I did it in residency. We would let that heal four to six months. Then we would re-enter underneath your gums, put the multi-unit abutment attachments on, then put your teeth on, right? So the whole process would take a long period of time. Um, now you're putting all your eggs in one basket, right? So now if you're, that, that's a lot happening, right? And so any dentist that you're doing the procedure with is gonna tell you, listen, if these implants go bad, this is gonna be catastrophic. Because we're now going re-entering. We're now taking out your implants that have failed, having to find new implants. And people think that just going ahead and finding new implant sites to place them in, that is not easy, right? We can talk about the uppers, for example. When we were originally placing those implants, we are trying to get what we call good anterior posterior spread. We're trying to get those implants as like, you know, in the right spots as far apart as from possible to give ultimate stability to your teeth, but at the same time trying to avoid your sinuses. So if I was to lose one of these back implants that is right close to the sinus because the patient was being too aggressive from chewing too hard and not following post-op instructions or didn't take their antibiotics, then now I have to place that implant in a site more forward. Ideally, I would love to go more further back but I can't because I'll be drilling into the sinus, which has, is nothing but an air-filled cavity, or I'm gonna be coming up more forward, but then if I do that, I'm gonna have what we call the bigger cantilever. Now, we know I could do a zygomatic implant or a pterygoid, but do you wanna start doing that immediately? You know, that's, again, is a very debatable topic, but, you know, the same thing goes on with the lower, right? Do I have good spots down here to avoid the mental nerve and not causing a person to be permanently numb? Like, again, like, that really, like us being the surgeons, it puts us in uncomfortable, stressful situations, right? I mean, to redo an implant, we place them ideally as we can the first time around. So once that gets compromised, we're no longer placing it where we wanted to initially. And to your point, and you've seen it during surgeries, now we've got to place it in a different site when we're hoping that it, that it does a better, better job than it did before. Right. But again, at what cost? Because even though we can get that implant in, if that has too long of a cantilever, what is going to be the long-term condition of the, the teeth and the implants, right? Because you don't want the teeth to break, right? Because it's not supported. Or you don't, again, want to drill into a nerve or anything like that. So I hate it when patients lose posterior implants because it, it's, it becomes a very stressful situation, right? Um, yeah, and also because of our long warranty period, we want, to, we want to do everything we can to make sure that things don't, really, things don't easily fail. Um, but going back to the diet uh, topic, I used I used to tell the patients to be on liquid diet for, for six weeks when I first started learning about this procedure. Um, but I understand that it's not really, really feasible for most people. I tried a juice cleanse for five days and I gave up after that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, you know, now I just tell patients to um, start with maybe a lot of smoothies. Uh, if you like certain type of food, then, you know, eat the puree form if possible. And then as you start feeling more comfortable, or if you, as, you, as your pain level decreases, you can start chewing on things that are a little bit harder. Um, so I like to um, use a lot of exercise analogies. I tell them, hey, when you're first running or working out for the first time, you cannot bench 300 or run a marathon. You gotta, you know, you gotta, uh, you gotta build, up build up to it, yeah. I like to tell people that we don't have clinical controlled studies where we have a thousand people that did all on four and we all locked them in a, a building for six months and fed them a certain type of diet, right? So everything is literally anecdotal. It's literally, hey, this is what I've seen from my patients, right? And then we've talked about it in other videos, but every patient, whenever they're doing all on four, every patient is a different level of candidacy. Right? A lot of patients, a vast majority of patients can be candidates, but 
everybody has different bone density. Everybody, like, like certain patients may have smaller sinuses versus larger sinuses affecting where we place those implants. You know, all these factors come into play in regards to what, um, like how dense your implants go in. So if your implants are going in with a higher level of torque because your, dent, your bone is more dense, then in theory, you should be able to handle a little bit of a more firm diet. Now, what I was you know, talking about for several minutes, just a, just a few minutes ago in regards to the, the consequences, because of that and because it becomes such a very stressful situation for us, um, trying to get implants in to the right spots, because again, Dr. Ku you know, just mentioned that we have a 10 year warranty on your implants and your prosthesis. You know? As the practice owner, I don't want your implants to fail, right? I don't want it to fail whether it's nine years from now or 15 years from now or 20 years from now. We're always gonna place your implants in your mouth as we would expect in our mouth. So that's why it becomes a stressful situation for us. And when we know that that could be a bad outcome, then we're gonna tell you, listen, you know, like you gotta hold out on your soft diet as long as possible, right? Keep that liquid or soft as long as possible. If they really ask me, like, you know, what, it, like, you know, to what point, or like, we don't have any studies, yeah. right? Everything is anecdotal. And again, we see so many patients and like what patients will tell you if they have a failure is like, oh yeah, I didn't smoke, you know, they've been, they've been smoking a pack a day. And then like, I haven't touched a cigarette. I haven't, I've been eating, like having nothing but juice for the last few months. So like, you know, that's not what the underside of your prosthesis is showing us uh, about the smoke. But, <laughs> but I mean, what we, like, we just want to put the fear of God into patients because again, like, you don't want to go through this process again, right? So um, yeah, that, that's kind of like my thought. But to answer your questions, you know, like you can have, you know, it's not just juice and yogurt, right? You can have soft pastas, you can have, you know, juice, you know, you don't want to eat anything crunchy, um, right? Point, like the soft diet that you said, because as, <clears throat> as, we, as we know, uh, like literature and stuff, um, and it's very logic, when we bite the chewing cycle, is a cycle like it goes like that the lower jaw like goes into and a, like a whole cycle before they they bite so we don't just chew like that so um and this is actually the lateral like movements of the implants are the more kind of catastrophic movements that you can actually exert on these implants so uh, what what we can do to avoid it is like how can we avoid that big um circle of the lower jaw before it closes so this actually depends on two different um, points. Like first of all, it's like how soft or like how hard the food is, and also um, how big the food is. So when you have a big piece in the mouth, the jaw will try to go through a bigger circle so that it can bite harder on that um, big size of food. So that's why we say, first of all, just try to find something soft, and secondly, chop it. Like have like small pieces in the mouth. And as we say, same thing with dentures. We try to let the patients know in the very beginning, just make sure you can cut your, your food and try something that's soft. So pasta or like uh, oatmeal or, you know, different kind of like soft things, especially for the very beginning, since they, we want to have these implants uh, being stable from the beginning so that we don't lose them. And I, I tell my patients, what is considered soft food? If you can grab your fork and you can push on it and it doesn't bend back, and you just go, if it's mushes, that's great. Because it's really, not, you're not really chewing, you're kind of just, as you said, you don't want to go lateral. Same thing with the, on, a, on a chair, right? If you're going side to side on a chair, it's going to lean, it's going to tilt. That's not what you want. If you want to go up and down, that's the best thing for an implant that's nice and stable because you don't want it to wobble. Both great answers. Like that's all we needed to say from the beginning, but I got long winded with my answer. <laughs> but, but I mean, like in all honesty, like I want, it's, I think it's very important that patients need to know the catastrophic consequences, right? So whether it's smoking, whether it's, you know, like chewing, whatever you want. And then let's bring in the other aspect is something that we can't really control, but whenever there's any sort of trauma involved, whether, you know, like, and you guys can say the same thing, like wisdom teeth extractions. We've seen people have wisdom teeth extractions or like a lot of extractions and they start clenching their teeth like crazy. And they start complaining about pain on another tooth that they never had before, but that's just your body's natural response to a surgery like this, right? So um, we had people that used to clench and grind before so they'd continue that or like, you know, they're just reacting after the surgery. Then they're putting a lot of force on the prosthesis, then it could cause the prosthesis to break. But if it's ex like exceeding that force, then it can really cause issues to those dental implants, right? 
Um, any other thoughts? I think off of that, I think you mentioned it, breakages, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really important um, with us. If there is a breakage that you come back to get that prosthesis fixed, because now you're putting uneven pressure on a site that broke, and now that one site is almost, I don't want to say it's compromised, but it's now it's prone to getting more forces at that one site, which could cause the failure. Right. So super important point. Because of cross arch stabilization, and it, when it's all one unit and the way the force is distributed when biting down on your set of teeth, if your prosthesis cracks, then you need to go in immediately and get a new prosthesis. Because yeah. what you're saying is that if you were to go like another week just biting on a broken prosthesis mm -hmm. and the stress now gets not distributed, but is now like overloaded onto the implants, yeah. boom, your implants can start failing on you. And the beauty of digital den dentistry is we can print it and mill it for you right? Pre pretty much next day if need right. be, because we know the importance of getting stabilization on your bike. Right, right. Depending on what time of the day we know, then we can like, we start printing it immediately, right? Yep. It takes like 45 minutes to print you a new set of teeth or, you know, milling will take like, an, you know, like two hours. But I mean, it, it's amazing like how quickly we can do that for you, right? So that's a, that's a very great, um, great point. All right, so let's talk about the next important topic, which is related to that uh, initial early healing phase, um, hygiene, home care, right? How do you keep your all on four prosthesis clean? You don't want too much food, gunk, bacteria building up in your mouth, right? Patients ask, how am I supposed to brush this, right? So what, let me go to you first, because I get, again, too long-winded with my answers. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Dr. Kukisaki? So, um... First, uh, what we need the patients to do is make sure they have a clean environment in the mouth. Um, they forget to, to brush their tongue, so that's one spot that uh, you get a lot of bacteria accumulation. That has uh, an impact on your breath as well, bad breath, because of that. So make sure you, you brush your tongue, then you have a different brush, soft bristles, to make sure you can brush your teeth. Um, after surgery, I know it's difficult to open and like have that dexterity to go ahead and brush the back teeth, but make sure whenever you can, you have to do that twice at, at least per day. Um, after the first month, we give water pick here, so that uh, that's another uh, tool that you can use so that you can actually clean the upper part of the prosthesis. Uh, and of course, as the months pass, the soft tissue gets shrinked down, um, everything is remodeling, so that means that it might create more gap between your actual gums and the fake gums of your prosthesis. That's why you can see some food that's going to be stuck in there unless you take you know, good care of that. Uh, with a water pick. So, um, uh, mouth, uh, good hygiene with uh, like um, toothbrush, water pick, uh, make sure you can go through the salt water in the beginning and also you can use whatever other mouthwash your dentist is um, suggested for you, is suggesting for you. Any, Any other thoughts? I mean, the biggest thing is like, um, I tell my patients, this is your second chance at brand new teeth, right? Because it's, uh, but it's not all on me or all on us. So the surgeons to place the teeth, to help restore the teeth, is now we need compliance. And compliance is always gonna be the big big issue with anything else. It's second chance at life, second chance to set of teeth. Like we need you more than anything else to make sure like everything goes well from surgery day, us telling you like what can happen, what cannot happen, and just following up with everything now. Cause it's, uh, it's more important, it's home care, like, like you were saying, Dr. Kukisaki, is, is really important to keep, make sure these last for a lifetime. Yeah, I tell patients the same thing. This is your second chance. So whatever habits that led to the breakdown of the original teeth, we got to break them. And in order to maintain the all on four teeth, we got to do everything we can to like keep them clean and make sure to come back to us at least once a year so we can detach the teeth, make sure that we do a lot of thorough cleaning around the implants and then put new screws. Because right. the, the, the screws are really tiny, so over time, those will weaken and even break. So they have to be replaced, I would say, at least once a year. Okay. So. Um, very interesting, like important points. I did want to expand um, one reason why we don't give the water pick to answer that question. Some people might say, well, why don't I get the water pick like immediately? When you do th this procedure and you have like fresh wounds and even though you, we suture you up, if that water spray was to go in and kind of like hit the wrong angles, then we can basically introduce debris or an infection up into your gums and cause an abscess. So that's why we don't do that. Um, I've always recommended salt water rinses. You know, we say like a teaspoon of salt in a cup of water, stir that, you know, warm water and then rinse for 30 seconds. 
Um, I'm not a fan of chlorhexidine, you know, as a periodontist, you know, I know a lot of us will recommend that post-surgery. I've been practicing 13 years, probably like seven, eight years ago, I discontinued that. Um, I am now a big fan of like a, let's say a 50, 50 mix of hydrogen peroxide and water. So like a one to one ratio, I mean, so, um, if you could buy like 3%, um, hydrogen peroxide over the counter and do like a one to one ratio of water in that and mix and, you know, rinse for 30 seconds. Um, also can, you know, whiten your prosthesis for you too. I'm a big fan of that. Um, you know, absolutely. You got to like brush your, your teeth really well. This, you know, getting a fake set of teeth doesn't mean that you don't brush your teeth and, you know, you, you still got to brush it. You brush all the surfaces. Um, just like you guys mentioned that this is on as much you as it is us during that healing period. It's very important to try to keep the bacterial load as low as possible. And how do we maintain long-term results, right? Me, I'm always like thinking like long term, like trying to avert like any potential issues down the long haul, right? So, um, I think basically, you know, you may have had periodontal disease, you know, years ago, you know, if if you talk to any periodontist to take your teeth out and when you had severe bone loss from periodontal disease, which is caused by bacteria, and if you were to tell them to do this procedure all in one day and put a prosthesis on. I can promise you there's not a single periodontist in the world that was thinking that this was a totally bulletproof solution doing all on four. Nobody in their right mind was thinking that, right? But we also know that it could be a great solution for you. Again, if you are trying to, um, if you take the teeth out, you do the bone reduction and you clean the bone and tissues and curette all the infection out and you take as good care as possible, like throughout the surgical process to disinfect um, everything within your power. But at the same time, you know, we are in theory getting rid of all the periodontal pathogens, but what is the likelihood that that could ever like come back? Like no one could ever tell you 100%, right? So that's like that paranoid part of my mind where I'm just like, okay, we need to just, you need to do as good of a job as possible, keeping your mouth clean as, you know, I want you to have your all on four for the next 30, 40, 50 years, um, however long you may live. Um, and the key aspect is that the integrity of the implants needs to be, you know, saved. I mean, we, we need to preserve that integrity of the dental implants and keeping a low bacterial load. So those are like all really key components, not over just like the short term post-surgery for how do you take care of your, your all on four, but also over the long haul. Um, and then one other thing that I think is a, a key point, does anyone have anything to add on to that? Because I, I wanted to go into a very key point. Um, you mentioned the tissue shrinkage, right? Anybody that does all on four will tell you, and this is why, and this is like, you know, we could beat a dead horse and maybe we'll go down that road and beat a dead horse <laughs> about the, the prosthesis and finals within a week, which is lunacy, right? But when you do an all on four or a denture, or you do any tooth extraction, you're going to lose bone. Your bone and your gum are going to shrink. That is your body's natural response. You can't avoid it. You can do whatever you want. You can even bone graft it. It's still going to shrink, right? Less, but it'll still shrink. Now, if we were to do um, basically a, an all-in-four procedure, and as the months go by, they have graphs of what you see, like amount of bone and gum shrinkage, how much that occurs. But when you have that bone and gum shrinkage, what ends up happening is you start developing a gap between your gums and your teeth, the prosthesis which is an area where the, back, the, the food particles or whatever can go in, right? Which is why it is very key that you have to use your water pick, right? Um, super floss, all these things that you can do. Now, what you wanna do is at a certain point, you don't get as extensive type of like remodeling of your tissues and bone. That's why we wait that period of time for us five months before we get your final prosthesis going because then we have to get another mold of your gums, right? I tell people a quick analogy. If there was this really cool shoe that came out, like this was like a new material that just doesn't wear. The rubber is like a type of super strong rubber that doesn't wear, nor any part of the fabric. It stays clean. You can get this set of shoes. It's a thousand dollars. This will be the last set of shoes you ever wear. Its fit is perfect. They get a laser type of mold of your foot, and this is going to be the last shoe you ever get. Now, However, you, you also had a, a foot surgery that you needed. You do the foot surgery. Would you ever get the mold for your foot the day after your surgery or the day of the surgery for the shoe that you're going to wear the rest of your life? When your foot gets swollen, right? 
who in their right mind would say that, right? But in essence, what we are doing is we are telling patients, don't worry about that surgery. I know your foot's swollen. Don't worry about that. Let me get a mold of your foot right now and you can wear that shoe. Six, five, five, six months from now, your foot's gonna be swimming in that shoe because what happened? You had so much, your, your foot isn't as swollen anymore. The same thing is exactly what happens with our mouths, right? You're, you have that swelling of the, after the surgery. You're trying to capture an impression that that patient is going to wear for the rest of the, like, their life. I mean, I know like what this is. This is a, a secret of dentistry. This is a, in, in, in my mind, it's a scandal. It's, it's basically a way for, you know, dentists or offices to rid themselves of an all on four patient and get them done as fast as possible. Because the repercussions of what happens is obviously sometimes a temporary can break, right? Other issues is that when you're trying to finalize a prosthesis later on, like five, six months down the process, like down the road, and you're trying to do try-ins and getting them to final, that requires more chair time, therefore requiring more overhead and more visits for the, like for the patient, right? So in my mind, I know that I'm coming out here and I might be pissing some people off by mentioning this, but that's rea the reality of what's going on. When you're bringing a patient in, you're doing all in four and you're basically printing them final in a week, that's like the worst thing you could do. And I could promise on my life and my kid's life, I would never do that in my mouth. You know, what are your thoughts? Exactly. Soft tissue, bone, everything is remodeling. And as soon as it settles down at that point, we can um, make the final mold so that you can actually get a fitted prosthesis. Otherwise, everything's gonna be very uncomfortable for you and for every patient because when they speak, they're going to have bubbles coming out. Also, they're going to feel like they're lisping, uh, even though the teeth will be probably in the correct position. So that's going to be something they're going to have to deal with. Um, and they've already gotten the, the final prosthesis, like the, the, the porcelain, the, the zirconia one. So that's something that um, that's something we're trying to avoid. I just wait that period of time and because it's just for the best of the patient. Right, right. Thoughts? No, I mean, I, I think you hit it on the nail on the head. There's, there's nothing that we can do to predict how, how, how much swelling or how much space is going to succeed or shrink after surgery. Some people swell like a balloon, so to think that they are going to stay there for the, the lifetime of the prosthesis is wrong, right. uh, at least from what I've seen. Um, so that's why it's you're doing yourself only a due diligence to make sure that you get a new capture of your tissues, of your bones, of your teeth, and we put it where it needs to be. So it's still the same model is for it to last a lifetime. Right. So this is, a uh, hope I don't get in trouble for saying this, but this is what I heard about some of these places that promise the same day final delivery or the next day final delivery. I heard a lot of those places now bring their patients back about three or four months after the surgery to make modifications to the final prosthesis uh, because they understand that there's going to be some bone and gum shrinkage over time. So yeah, they, when they advertise themselves, they you know, promise, oh yeah, we're going to give you the you know, same day teeth or the next day teeth, but understand that many times they bring the patient back. And then, so is it really the same day final delivery in that case? In that case. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's false advertising. Yeah. I, I, and I checked out somebody else's ad in regards to like, they also did final because I was like, what like they were promising zirconia and it was actually a different material that it was like a zircon, uh, yeah, like it was a, it was a, it was a, a different spin. So there's a lot of marketing that's, you know, kind of like misleading for patients. Yeah. Right. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't necessarily think that's, that the right, that's the right thing. And then. Also, there's other materials that they say that they can deliver faster. And, you know, I actually, we've tried some of the materials, right? You know, some of the nano ceramics and, you know, like, you know, and wasn't a big fan. We were seeing patients in their final fracturing teeth. And it wasn't just one person that had a, a crazy bite or anything like that. This was multiple patients. So they, I it literally, like, I tried it out for six months and I was like over it, right? And I actually talked about this nano ceramic in some of my other videos because I was excited on what the the reps were telling me about the integrity and you know the non-staining and all that stuff and then I was looking at these prostheses like you know six months a year out and I was not happy about the results you know so that's why we stopped using it all right guys so let's talk about a controversial topic because dentistry is very subjective right and then this confuses patients and I'm trying to just picture myself in their shoes and I would be very very confused right so 
whenever a patient goes in, like, again, we recommend you guys always go in for consultations, right? Maybe you've been going to a dentist for years and so you're just now seeking another all in four consultation or um, like you should do your due diligence, long story short, is what I tell patients they should do. But um, dentistry, you know, we don't have to tell you this, dentistry is very subjective. You're going to go see three different dentists, you're going to get three completely different opinions. Right? And that goes in regards to whether you need a deep cleaning, whether you need a gum surgery, whether you need a crown, whether you need a root canal. And of course, it's, it extends over to all on four, right? Um, I feel that um, all on four is a, a can be a very divisive subject, right? And absolutely, why not? Because um, you know, on one side, let, let's like make a quick example. Someone may tell you that you need a root canal and a crown. Another person says that root canal and crown um, has could have a better predictability by going the implant route, right? We know that that we've seen that argument many times. Now let's extend that argument, where now we can debate whether doing an all on four and you know we're taking teeth out and we're placing implants and so to some providers some dentists for us to say that when we are trained to go out there and try to save teeth for someone like yourself to now tell a patient to take their teeth out and now go the route of all on four that is like you know blasphemy right so let's let's talk a little bit about this like what are your thoughts in regards to like you know this very divisive topic i mean it's it's, it's so hard because it's uh you're trying to fit can you fit all your eggs in one shell or can you fit everything in one basket it really becomes to it's it's a conversation that you need to have and it's a really thorough conversation with going through it all in four because we've talked about the process the step that it takes and the journey that it takes um but also you have to ask the patient do you want to go on that journey or do you want to fix this one tooth? And are you going to fix the remaining part of your tooth? What's going to change about your hygiene to keep this one tooth and how that's not going to affect the remaining dentition of your teeth? And I also ask the patient, how often do you want to be at the dentist? Right, and what is the cost involved? Because it's, I've had fearful patients like, you know, I'm, I'm willing to do, I want to fix all my teeth, and what does it take? And I'm telling you, well, you need four, four or five root canals. And because you're so anxious, you need to be sedated every single time. Right? Do you want to go through that, or do you? And then I refer the patient to you because for that same exact reason, because he was told by his previous dentist, I can keep all my teeth, but I don't want to go to the dentist every single time. Right? I I can't imagine paying an anesthesiologist every single time to fix my teeth. And then so you have to have that conversation with them, and they have to know all their options. That's that's the biggest thing. If you know all your options and you're willing to go through X, Y, and Z, then once you choose what you want to choose, I will guide you there. Right. I would say that would be the biggest thing. Okay. I love that. And I know exactly what patient you're talking about. And, you know, you, you bring up a, a super key point is like, and, and I'll, I'll chime in again at the end. What are your thoughts? Yeah, this brings back some memories from dental school. I remember regarding this one patient, I remember um, a resident in the endodontics, the root canal specialist, and a, a resident at Perio. They had a, I think they had a fight over a case. <laughs> Did you have a similar experience? Not in residency. Not in residency. I had an endodontist call me and threaten me one time over something, and it was like completely, it was a story that was completely lost in translation, and it was like bizarre, but yeah. I, I think, I think as, as dentists, and sometimes even practice owners, you forget that that's a human being in your chair. Right. right? You don't do what's best for your pocketbook or for your office. Do what's yeah. best for them so that they know they can maintain whatever you give them for as long as they can. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. I'm sorry, but... Yeah, <laughs> so um, depending on with what office you go to, um, you're gonna be you know told like a different, or you're gonna be, you're gonna be given different like a clinical opinions and treatment options. Uh, for instance, I once worked for a dentist that didn't do any implants. So whenever there were like more, you know, multiple gaps or teeth missing, he would just put bridges to fill those gaps. Um, you know, it, under you know the hands of a skilled clinician that can work. But then, like I said, um, every dentist has a, a different opinion. So some dentists may say, oh, that's like, you know, that's like too much. That, or that's, some may even say, oh, that's like malpractice, <laughs> depending on who you talk to. Um, but here we do a lot of all on four treatment for sure. But uh, we're go we're, we make sure to go over, you know, pros and cons of each treatment option. And uh, we are a multi-specialty office, so 
if a patient is interested in preserving as many teeth as possible, yeah, we can definitely give a patient that option. Um, we have Dr. Kukusagi who loves doing veneers and full mouth um, crown and bridge work. So if that's what patient's leaning toward, we can certainly offer that option. But if a patient doesn't want to see the dentist too frequently, then we can also offer the all in four option. Okay, so what are your thoughts, Dr. Kukusaki? Um, so as a prosthodontist, um, I try to see things in a comprehensive way. Uh, so I don't want to go ahead and just have some patches on in the mouth and on the teeth. That means that I want to see uh, but the, but what are the solutions and the treatment options that we can give so that the patient can live with these for a long time, like till the rest of their lives if possible. Um, so in this, uh, in this thinking, uh, there are two there are two parts. Like it's the patient part and it's the doctor part. Doctor part is like they have to assess what's in the mouth, what are the options for them. Uh, they it can be um, just extracting teeth and have like a long term solution with let's say Olonex, or it can be also like treating each and every one, each and every tooth individually with crowns or like also having soft tissue grafts, whatever, whatever the patient needs. Uh, once we give these options to the patient and give them like the timeline, the cost, uh, pros and cons, as you mentioned, then after that, it's on the patient. Patient's compliance for hygiene, patient's uh, time that he has to spend in the, in the office plays a big role in the final, let's say, de decision. Um, so, so the treatment modifier is on the patient. So whatever the patient likes, whatever the patient feels that he can handle, you know, basically for, from these treatment options, we go from that. I love that answer. Um, my final perspective is um, you're absolutely right. You guys bring like a, a lot of valid points in regards to, and then, you know, I, I, you know, I, I say a very similar thing. You know, I, I brought up an example. I made a video about my dad years ago and he's not the only one. I've seen patients, I've placed 10 to 15,000 implants in my career. And um, sometimes I, I've seen patients come in and I see like eight, nine, 10 implants I placed in their mouth over like 10 years. And I, I sit there and I wonder, and I'm like, man, what, like, what's going on here? You know? And I look back and I see like, you know, with us doing all on fours, this patient could have been a perfect all on four. And then I like wonder, okay, what did this patient look like on day one? Should I have recommended them doing all on four on day one? Because had they done an all on four, all on X back in the day, they would have saved themselves a ton of money and a ton of time over the process, right? But the other side of that is like patients need to understand is that we can't take everybody who's at that snapshot in their life and predict what they're going to look like five, 10, 15 years down the road, right? So... Um, my dad's story was that he had a bunch of crowns and bridges, but I mean, when you take a look at the x-rays because the crown is so white or a bridge is so white, you can't see the decay underneath there. The decay shows up as darkness, right? So short of us removing all the crowns or destroying the crowns in this case, I wouldn't have been able to predict what was going on. I was just doing what his general dentist was recommending to be done. done. So, you know, over four years, we ended up placing six implants and sinus lifts and all these bone grafts and all the appointments and you know again my dad's a physician he's not afraid of going to the dentist but in the end four years later he was exhausted you know he was like man why didn't you do an all in for me i was like dad you know i didn't know this was going to happen to you like i didn't know like all this was going underneath your crowns and bridges and i've seen other patients like that and so we're not being good dentists if we don't sit there and question what we're doing right and the same thing goes with all on four may not be the answer either. Like just putting everybody in all on four is not the answer either, right? So even if we're doing that too, we got to question, you know, what, what we're doing, right? And so, you know, this, this question is just like so multifaceted, right? Like what you're bringing up at like valid points is just patients, you, you also need to know yourself too. You know, you mentioned also is like they may be interested in doing a procedure is like, you know what, I'm motivated. I want to get those like crowns and veneers or those root canals and I'm committed finally. I know I haven't been good about going to the dentist. And now I know, yeah, I'm fearful, but I'll do the sedations, multiple sedations. You see like the price and it's like, you see the cost of it. But even if it's not a cost thing, are you prepared for all those appointments over the next several years? And then are you prepared maybe five, 10, 15 years down the road that these crowns and bridges or whatever root canals start failing on you. 
because now we're talking about round four, right? And so I don't think there's necessarily a wrong answer. If a dentist then said, you know what, you know, you, you do have a valid point, but I think that a patient should be in their natural dentition as long as possible. So therefore we should do the gum surgery. We should do the root canals and crowns. We should do the crowns and then have them spend $40,000. And then 10 years later, because we bought 10 years of time now, keep in mind, now they're ready for their own floor, right? Now, what, do I, what, what are my thoughts on that? Like, is there anybody that's necessarily right or wrong with that? I mean, again, this is so subjective. If we have a debate with 20 different dentists here from every different specialty, plus every general dentist that does a lot of procedures, like everybody, like we'll just get in a, like a, like a 24 hour debate and nobody's, nobody's gonna win, right? There's no winning that argument. So I think you guys, again, bring back a, a valid point is like, and that's the way that I'm always focusing. And I was like, what would I do if I was in that chair, right? Now, what patients need to understand is we have legal obligations, you know, according to the dental board, we have to go over all your options. You have the option of doing nothing, or you're doing crowns, bridges, treating your gum disease, doing all these things. And then we tell you the cost of that. We have to lay the expectations of how many appointments. We have to go over that. We then go over like a, like, you know, if you're going to lose your teeth, a complete denture option, a snap on denture option, a all on four option. I hate doing snap on dentures, but I still have to offer that as a recommendation. And I hate them because I don't think that they can ever meet patients' expectations, you know? But, you know, to let patients know that, listen, I'm not financially motivated because I tell patients, quite frankly, if I was going to do an all on four on you, we're going to make less money off of you versus should we do all these individual implants and we do those crowns on you and I do that gum surgery and the root canals, whatever it is. But chances are, because all on four, what patients really need to understand is that I know that patients think, whoa, all on four, all on X is such an expensive treatment option. But, you know, especially that matters on which part of the country you live. But comparatively speaking, compared to like doing individual implants or all these other treatment options too, you're gonna save money, right? So we're not trying to tell you to do this because of financial means. And we're also not saying, you know, the beauty of having prosthodontists and general dentists here, we do it all. We're not trying to pigeonhole you into a treatment, right? You're right, like a patient needs to do their own research and be their own advocate. You guys need to do the best research you possibly can because if you go to an all on four center, you're gonna to be told to do an all on four. If you go to another place that just like does bridges all the time, you're gonna to be told to just do bridges. If you, you know, like you're gonna be told, you go to a periodontist office, you may be told to do gum surgery to death do it three times over the next 10 years and suffer the consequences of your horrible aesthetics, of your gum shrinkage, of your black triangles. And like, you know, I've seen so many, like, and this is a true story. I've seen it over and over and over again. I see female patients that hate their smile, right? They're like, well, my periodontist, my dentist told me that I had to do the gum surgery and I had to hold on my teeth. And like, I hate my smile and I never want to smile anymore. And I just lost confidence on blah about my, you know, just like my confidence and smile. But that's what the dentists too do. And then like I see them, I'm like, it doesn't have to be that way. You know, you can have a great long lasting solution and be able to smile confidently again and feel that joy and still be able to chew without having pain because you have 50% bone loss or a lot of soft tissue recession from osteosurgery, all these, all these things. And I, as a periodontist, I know I'm probably drawing the ire of many periodontists, but that's the reality, you know? So... Um, this topic, I like, you all know me, I can just, and my staff will tell me, I, I just talk in circles, so I can talk like an hour about this myself. But, you know, just to, you know, you know, just bring some semblance of closure to this, what, what would be, you know, my, like our final advice? What, what do you guys, what's your final advice on this topic? I mean, um, I, I guess being a practice owner, being a dentist just for so long, I think the biggest thing with me is, um, you, you got to go to someone you trust because at, at some point, once you find that person, you have to be able to trust them that they'll do what's, for, what's best for you. Right. Whether it's maybe you're not ready for that one step, but as long as they're, they're taking you through that process with you, and you have someone that's reassuring you, motivating you, just like a life coach or whatever it may be, it's going to help you find that answer that you think is best for, suited for you. And we may not be it, but I, I will tell you with multi specialties. We may not agree on every little thing that we talk about, mm -hmm. right? Because we're all individuals and stuff like that. I mean, but we will help guide you where you need, where we feel like you need to be, and that's and that's the most important part. Awesome, I love that. I totally agree with that. You got to be able to trust your provider. You got to have somebody who's in your best interest. 
Um, another recommendation is maybe find a group practice. You know, just try to avoid being pigeonholed. Try to get um, an office with multiple providers that you know that they don't care what direction you go. You want to go to a guy that sells cars or an SUV or a truck. You know, like you might not know what may be best for you. You want to have a guy selling you a car that's basically going to try to match you to what your needs are. So that's why it's super important. Go to a person that's going to ask what's important to you, right? That's, that's the key thing. That's the first thing that we always ask. Like, what's most important to you? And then we're going to work around it. Do you hate going to the dentist? Are you fearful of going to the dentist? Because it's not reality for us to do all these appointments. And then you have to do, like, another good question is not even just hate going to the dentist. How good are you with oral hygiene? You can love going to the dentist, but you have horrible, horrible oral hygiene. Because then you're not as great of an, a crown candidate or a gum disease treatment, right? I tell patients all the time if I'm doing osteosurgery for gum surgery or lenap laser gum surgery, I tell them all the time, like setting expectations, don't even go down that road if you're not finding religion about taking care of your teeth. Otherwise, I'm stealing your money and it's not worth it. And we need to like con consider other options. So um, those are just kind of like small little takes that I have. What are your thoughts? I definitely agree with the trust um, um, issue. And um, I feel like in this battle of like trying to get beautiful smiles, functional smiles and um, functional speech, In that battle, there are two ways. Uh, we give our best, the patient gives, our, gives their best. So it's just a two-way um, win. Like we, we can win this by just ourselves. The patient has to be also very, very, um, you know, willing to, to go into that road and trust their, their doctor. And this way we can both win. I love that. I, I say it's like, I always give my gym analogy. It's like finding that trainer. You know, he has your best interests at heart, but it's a, it's a, it's a two-way street, right? It's, you know, you maintaining your diet and your exercise after the fact, too. Yeah. Any other thoughts? Yeah, so we take a lot of pride in what we do and we get good outcomes, but I encourage all my, all my patients to, you know, get second opinion if they want. Ultimately, I think that every patient needs to go with a provider that they're most comfortable with because the way I see it, once an implant is in a patient's mouth, I'm technically married to that patient. If there's an issue, the patient's going to come back to me. Um, so make sure to go with the provider that you're most comfortable with. And I encourage everyone to get, you know, second and third, fourth opinion if they need to. Absolutely. This yeah. is a huge decision. And anybody that's telling you not to seek second opinions doesn't have your best interests at heart. So great feedback. I appreciate you guys coming in this morning. So I'll see you guys later. <laughs>